Welcome back to Operating Systems. In today's lecture, we'll discuss the management of main memory, so one of the most important resources of our computer system. So, to revisit resources once more, uh, let's remember the tasks of an operating system. So an operating system has to administer the sources of a computer, and it also has to create abstractions for these resources that enable a programmer that uh, is going to write an application to use these resources easily and also efficiently. And so far we have seen one abstraction, this is processes. So processes are a concept to abstract from the real CPU or CPUs in our system in order to enable this view that every process has the CPU of a system for its own. So in this lecture, we're going to discuss memory. So how to administer main and background memory, so our RAM in our computer here, as well as any secondary storage which we can use to, for example, uh, store parts of the memory that we currently not use if we are running out of memory. Most computers nowadays, as we've seen, use multiprogramming. And if we use multiprogramming, we have a problem if we have lots of I.O. So this diagram here shows the CPU load under the assumption of a given probability that a process has to wait for I.O. So essentially, if a process has to wait for I.O. 20% of the time, the CPU utilization uh, can go up to 100% if you have like three processes at least. But if you have more I.O. wait time, like 50% or even 80% waiting time for I.O., it's very difficult to actually use the CPU completely to 100% because it takes far more processes running in parallel in order to ensure that whenever there's a process switch due to a process being, uh, yeah, starting an IO uh, operation, that there's another process that is ready to run. And we can uh, actually uh, build a formula for this. So the load L of a CPU is uh, equal to one minus the probability of our IO. So multiprogramming, as we've seen, is essential to guarantee high CPU utilization because otherwise we would just be waiting for our IO processes, uh, for IO devices to deliver data. So uh, multiprogramming implies that we start and terminate processes and that we switch between processes. So when we do this, we need to allocate memory at the start of a process and we also need to dynamically release memory, so to free memory when a process is terminated. So the requirements for a memory management component of an operating system imply that we have multiple processes that need main memory. Processes share the main memory, but this means they have different sections of the main memory for their own use. So processes are located in different positions in main memory, as you can see here. So if this would be the main memory and we have two applications and the operating system. This upper part here could be used by the OS. And then there's a larger process one, which uses a bit more main memory and a smaller process two, using a bit less main memory. Now, if we switch between these processes, what could happen is without any protection that process one would try to access, read or write data of process two or even read or write data uh, belonging to the operating system. So we have to protect the parallel activities going on at the same time in our computer against each other. So we have to protect the operating system against accesses from our processes. So no process should be allowed to arbitrary read or right in the operating system address space and we have to address processes uh, we have to protect processes against each other so that process one is not allowed to access any data of process two and the other way around if you have either a small main memory or a large number of processes what can happen is that the size of your main memory is too small to fit all processes into memory at the same time so you have to somehow work around this situation so your operating system actually has to know which process allocates which amounts of memory and which areas of memory in your main memory. It has to administer these free memory areas and of course it has provide methods to allocate free memory areas. And if we are running out of memory, what we can do is we can copy 
memory contents of a given process to our disk, so our background or secondary storage, uh, of course, uh, and then use this memory for something else. And uh, this means, of course, when we switch back to that process that we've just swapped out to our background storage, well, this implies we have to swap it in back again uh, when we need to switch to that process again. So our operating system has to perform swapping of processes. It also has to ensure that a process that it was swapped out can be swapped in somewhere in memory. So if we have something like absolute addresses and data in our program, uh, the operating system has to perform relocation of addresses, of instructions uh, using addresses in programs. And our operating system can actually use hardware support to do this, so it makes its own life easier. So in order to perform efficient memory management, we have to apply policies or strategies. And these have to apply it on all levels of the memory hierarchy. So we've seen different levels of main mem uh, of memory hierarchy. So usually register allocation is controlled by your compiler. Cache allocation is automatically, but allocating RAM and background storage is especially important. So in order to provide some memory uh, placement strategies, we need a placement policy. So this implies uh, ask, uh, answering the question, which area of memory should be allocated? If we have a memory request, should it be maybe the one with the largest or smallest fragmentation? We'll talk in a bit uh, in more detail about fragmentation. Uh, that's probably not that relevant. Fragmentation is secondary. The first uh, problem would really to, uh, be to fit uh, the memory request into the available memory. We might need uh, to talk about a fetch policy. So when we are swapping processes, when should we swap in memory contents? So should we swap in memory contents on demand? So when our operating system decides it wants to switch to a process that's currently swapped out to background storage here, if this happens, of course, there's a large latency before this process can actually be started because we have to swap it in from disk again. Or do we have something like a predictive policy uh, where we could actually try to swap in memory contents in advance? And of course, if we're running out of memory, we need some sort of replacement policy. So we need to decide which memory contents should actually be swapped out if the system is running out of free memory. So if there are more memory requests that can then can be fulfilled with the amount of memory available. So this could be the oldest one, the least used one uh, content of memory. So uh, administered in some blocks or maybe the one that is used for the longest amount of time, because that one has used uh, the main memory for quite a long time already. So uh, it should give way for another process with, uh, which has memory requests. So when we look at a, a typical simplified memory map, what we call it of a simple 32-bit system, we see we have the addresses starting from zero to the maximum possible 32-bit address, so a 32-bit value with all bits set to 1 or hexadecimal 8Fs. And very often uh, your available memory is somehow distributed and constrained. So maybe in some computers you have the top of physical memory uh, reserved for ROM, so maybe your BIOS or boot ROM in your machine that uh, actually uh, manages to start up the machine when uh, you power it up. And then you may have different memory areas. For example, you might have a main memory area here in this lower address range here. This doesn't have to start at the physical address zero, actually. You might have an additional main memory address here at some upper range of addresses. And in between, you may, may have memory ranges that are not RAM or ROM, but these are so-called memory mapped I.O. addresses. So essentially by accessing these addresses, you don't store any value, but you access an I.O. device like a serial interface or a disk. So all of this has to fit into your available address space. So for example, into 32 bit wide address space. So into like 4 billion byte addresses. But uh, if we have a situation like this, like uh, our RAM would be split among two areas here, then we need to make sure that an allocation that doesn't fit into that lower RAM area maybe somehow uh, is possible if we use additional RAM here, even if the both areas here, the address ranges of these both areas are not contiguous. So the problem the operating system has to solve is that the available main memory is used by a number of 
different things. So first, of course, by multiple user processes. So for the program code, the text segment, for program data, so data, BSS segments, and so on. And of course, for dynamically allocated pieces of memory like our stack and our heap. In addition, the operating system needs memory for itself, for its code and data, and especially for uh, yeah, data structures used to administer processes, so process control blocks, and also for storing data buffers for input and output. Uh, so you can uh, have a faster input and output without waiting for devices. So we need to be able to split up our memory between all these different requirements. So we need methods to provide memory allocation. And this is a functionality, obviously, of our operating system. So very early operating systems chose to do a, uh, to use a very simple approach, which is called static memory allocation. And the idea behind this is to simply use fixed memory areas for the operating system, as well as for user processes. Now, this has a number of problems. For one, if you have fixed areas, well, there's a limited degree of multi-programming. So if you had two programs that would actually decide to use the same memory area, then these programs cannot be in memory at the same time because one would override the other. So essentially, we wouldn't be able to do a process switch between those two without a lot of overhead. We might also have a limitation of other resources, for example, a limitation of I.O. bandwidths, because we might have only reserved a small amount of memory for I.O. buffers. And if this amount is too small and we have a large, uh, large amount of I.O. requests, then essentially we would have to wait for our I.O. device longer because we can't store that much data inside of our operating system before our user process that requests that data is actually able to uh, fetch data from the operating system. And also if we, uh, for example, do a static partitioning and we reserve too much space for the operating system itself, uh, it's impossible to use this operating system for application processes or the other way around. So we're very much restricted. So uh, very early on, the idea was to actually uh, give up the static memory allocation and to use sort of a dynamic memory allocation. So the first approach to provide some sort of dynamic memory allocation was to split our memory into so-called segments. So a segment, we've seen our address space. A segment is a contiguous area of memory. So addresses that are one after the other, starting from a base address and then without any interruption going until an address, which is the base address plus the size of our segment. And then the operating system needs to provide functionality to allocate and also to release segments. And these segments can obviously be all these segments part of, uh, that are part of programs we've seen already. So text segments, data segments, stack segments, and so on. So whenever there's a request for a segment, the operating system has to search for suitable memory allocates to perform this allocation. And this especially happens when a program is started because then we need more memory for this new program. So when we have segments that share our complete main memory address space, we need sort of placement policies. And especially important here is the management of free memory to ensure that we can find a free segment when there is an additional allocation. So let's start with a very simple approach to perform memory allocation. Uh, what uh, is really important that we need to represent free segments, so unused segments of main memory, because these are the ones we need to refer to when another memory allocation takes place. Sometimes we also want to refer to allocated segments of memory uh, in addition. And a very simple approach is to use bit lists. So what we do is we split up our memory address space into areas of identical size, so indicated by these small ticks here, and then we indicate for each section of this size. So this may be, I don't know, 16 bytes, 64 bytes, whatever your operating system decides to, uh, to allocate here. And for each of these identical sized sections, we store one bit and this bit contains the information if this current sub parts, uh, so segment of your memory is actually used. So we store a one here. So we have an allocation A here with five segments here. So we have five bits set to one for the first five segments in our memory here or blocks in our memory. Then we have three unused blocks here. So we store three 
zero bytes here, then we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten uh, blocks used by allocations B and C. So we have eight plus two, ten additional bits set to one, indicating that these blocks are used. Then we have two free blocks again, corresponding to these two zeros here. We have four additional used blocks for allocation D, uh, which are represented by these one bits here and so on. Now the problem is, depending on the size of your blocks you want to administer, these bit lists can require quite a lot of memory, so one bit per block obviously. And uh, when you try to release memory at a certain address, so for example we want to release memory A here, we need to indicate that actually A takes five blocks, because we need to set all these blocks here to zero in order to enable that all of these can be reused later on. So in order to do this, you either have to know the memory size of a certain block, so you need to provide an additional meta information, or you have to provide this information when freeing blocks. Why don't we just use the uh, space until the next free one? Now, this can be seen here, so we have directly allocated uh, re requests B and C one after the other. So if we would release B and only use a contiguous section of allocated blocks that we free, we would accidentally also free our allocation C, which is of course not what we want, because this could then be accidentally reallocated while another process is using it. Now, uh, so we have, uh, well, quite high storage requirements here. Uh, we have to know the size of a block, and in addition, we also have to search through our bit list linearly here until we find a sequence of zeros that is big enough uh, for the request that has just shown up. So this is a linear search and this can be very slow, especially if your free memory is somewhere towards the end of your physical memory. So what we can do is to use a more sophisticated approach and one of these more sophisticated approaches is a linked list. So what we do here is we uh, keep a separate list of meta information. So we have a pointer pointing to the start of our list and for each block that is allocated in memory, we no longer keep any bitmaps. But what we do now is uh, we actually store this meta information and this meta information consists of a bit indicating if this block is used, indicated by U here, or if it's free, indicated by an F. Then we indicate the start address, so at which block does uh, this area start, so for example at block here, uh, 0 here, and how many blocks does it take, so A would take 5 blocks. So this information here would indicate we have a used memory block that starts at address 0 and takes up 5 blocks. Now, for this one, we have to store the free information also uh, to, in order to find free blocks. So we need to add another element to our linked list. This indicates we have a free block here, starting at address 5 of size 3. And this points to our next block, which indicates it's a used block, starting at address 8, having a length of 6, linking to another used block, starting at address 14 with a length of 4, and so on. Now you see some of this information is obviously redundant, so uh, we know if we have a used block with address 0 and of size 5, we would no longer need to store the start information, but keeping it redundant here uh, makes it easier to administer the list. So here we represent used and free segments in a linked list. Now uh, obviously to find a free segment you still have to linearly search through your list for a free segment here but you don't need to count the number of free bits here, but you only have to check if the allocation actually fits in the size of that free segment here. Now the problem is, this is a linked list and this can grow dynamically, so the more used and free segments you have in main memory, the more memory our list needs, so you need to add additional elements to the end here. And this memory itself has to be allocated dynamically, so maybe you have sort of a chicken and egg problem here when you try to implement this linked list management. Now this problem can be solved using a little trick, and this little trick is actually to use the free memory me uh, segments themselves to store the information about the linked lists. So we only need to store one pointer to our first free segment in main memory. So uh, in this free segment, instead of storing zeros or whatever, we store the information that there's a free segment of length 3, and in the next free uh, element of this uh, free segment we store a pointer to 
the following three segments. So a pointer to the first byte of this segment here, or block. And this has the information, okay, this one has size two, and again, a pointer to the next one. So uh, this uh, helps, but of course, we have to ensure a minimum gap size here of two blocks, whatever, to guarantee that we can store the length of this, uh, the free segment, and in addition, a pointer to the next free gap we have here. Now, uh, this is maybe a bit inefficient, so maybe we also want to search backward in our list because we're at some location here where we searched and uh, we need to go back. So maybe to increase efficiency, we also want to implement backward links to the previous free gap here, uh, which uh, requires more overhead here and uh, is a bit more difficult to get right because you have to ensure the consistencies of the for, uh, forward and backward pointing pointers. And this representation here is dependent on the allocation strategy. So from some strategies, it might not work well. Now, uh, of course, one important question is uh, what happens when we release memory? So let's use our representation from the previous slide again. So storing information about free blocks in the gaps themselves. So this is our initial situation here from our previous slide. So we have two, three blocks and we have four allocated sections, A, B, C, and D. So what we can do now is to release B. And in order to release B, we have to do one thing. So we have to, well, keep this pointer here because, well, there is no additional free section. And the only thing that has changed is the length of our free section here. So B is no longer in memory. So now we have our previous three elements plus the following former six elements of B here. And this together makes nine free elements here. Of course, if we uh, free, for example, element C here, we would also have to reset the pointer here and to change these two elements to form a new free block. So one question is, if you have a number of free blocks and there's a memory request, uh, which strategy for a placement do you actually use? So which of these free gaps that's available in your memory would you actually choose to allocate memory for a new request from a process? Now, these placement strategies are based on different sorting policies for the list of gaps we have. So very simple strategies, first fit. So with first fit, uh, this means our list of gaps is sorted uh, according to increasing memory addresses. And so we go through our list of free gaps here from address zero or whatever the address of, of our first free memory segment is. And then we go through our list and we always check, we have a size of a memory request of N, and we check if this size actually fits. So if the gap we found is big enough to fulfill this request, so it can be as big as the request or even bigger. And this would mean we use the first fitting gap in our first fit strategy. What we can also do is uh, what is called rotating first fit or next fit. Here also our gaps are sorted after the memory address and this works like first fit, but uh, we don't start with the very first gap at uh, each allocation, but we remember the last gap we actually allocated and start with this when we continue searching for the next free gap. Now, this has one reason. It's, it's very similar, obviously, to first fit. And the reason for implementing it like this is to avoid the generation of a large number of small gaps at the beginning of the list. Because we, with first fit, we always use the first one that fits and reduce that gap to the rest that remains when we fulfill the allocation. And this means we accumulate a large number of very small gaps at the beginning, which are the fragmentation, uh, because our requests are not exactly the size of the gaps, but they might be a bit smaller. We can also use best fit. So here we would require uh, for efficient search the, that the gaps are sorted after the gap size, starting with the smallest. So here we want to reduce fragmentation. So what we do is we go through all of our free gaps here. And as soon as we find the first one where our request fits in, because they're sorted after the smallest first, and then increasing sizes. So we just use the first one that actually fits. So we use the smallest fitting gap that is as big or bigger as the request we've just received. We could also use worst fit. This would require the uh, blocks being sorted after the gap size with the largest beginning. And worst fit would mean we find the largest fitting gap. Uh, 
Does this make sense? Uh, obviously, yes, because otherwise we wouldn't have uh, listed it here. So finding the lar largest fitting gap means that the probability of still having a very large remaining gap after performing the allocation is quite high. So we could reuse this gap many times for a number of different allocations until it has shrunk enough. But of course, problems can show up. And these problems are that many gaps are actually too small. So after a large number of memory allocations, we only have very many small gaps, gaps left and we might not be able to find a gap that's large enough for a larger allocation. And this problem is called fragmentation. So if you fused uh, old MS-DOS uh, operating systems on a PC, like from the 1980s, you know there's fragmentation also taking place on disks, which has the same problem. Now for disks, it only slows down operation because the diskette has to move. And uh, for DOS, you regularly were, uh, it was recommended to perform a so-called defragmentation of your disk, which actually reordered blocks on the disk. Well, for memory, you could do the same, but we'll talk about more advanced strategies in a bit. So a more sophisticated method to allocate memory and to place memory requests into physical memory is the so-called body method or body allocator. And this uh, body allocator actually splits our available memory dynamically into areas of, the, of a size which is a power of two. So to a, of a size of two to the power of n. So let's look at an example here. We have 1024 blocks in memory and initially all these 1024 blocks are unused and then our first request comes in requesting 70 blocks of memory. Now we need to find a split that actually fits this 70 blocks of memory and also is a power of 2. So the next largest power of 2 larger than 70 or equals or larger to 70 is 128. So we split our 1024 blocks we had available initially into powers of 2. So we need to provide one a section of 128 blocks here, which is allocated to A. So accordingly, the other section here should also be split into 128. So we have 128 block here left. left. Then uh, the rest needs to be also split into powers of two. So what remains is a larger section here of 256 blocks and an even larger one of 512 blocks. All right, so our next request comes in. This request has a size of 35 blocks, which means we have to find another power of 2 that uh, where 35 blocks fit in. So the next largest one is 64. So now we choose uh, the next power of 2 here, 128, split it into two halves and allocate the first half, so 64 blocks to B, have the remaining 64 blocks here, and the rest stays unchanged. A third request comes in requesting 80 blocks. So again, we need uh, 128 blocks. Uh, so this doesn't fit in here because this is only 64. So what we have to do is we have to split the next one here into two 128 block segments here. So this one here is allocated to request C. And we have remaining three segments here of 128, 512 and the small one here with 64. Now when we release A, we just release these 128 blocks. So we cannot join this together with any adjacent memory because we still have the allocation of B here. Uh, then we have another request of 60. Now the request of 60 fits into a block of uh, block size 64. So this means we don't have to split this 128 block again because we have one of 64 free here. Uh, so we can just allocate this request D in this gap here. When we release B, we release uh, these 64 blocks here. Now, still we cannot join these two because these two would together only be 192 blocks, so not a power of two. And we always want to allocate powers of two. So only when we release D, well, we can actually put these two together to 128, or we could have even put them together finally to create a 256 uh, block size uh, gap here. And when we finally release uh, C here, then all of our memory is free again, so we can join all of these blocks together to a large block with 1024 again. So one term we've discussed already uh, in regarding memory allocation is fragmentation. So what is fragmentation? Now we need to distinguish between two kinds of fragmentation. We've seen both of them already. 
So one kind is external fragmentation. So external fragmentation means we split up a free block, like we have a block of 100 bytes, and we have an allocation of 70 bytes. We will split this up into 70 used bytes and 30 free bytes. So our fragment is very small, that's free, and it's only 30 bytes. So these allocations uh, in this style would create memory fragments outside of the allocated memory areas, which maybe cannot be used because they're too small. And this is a problem that occurs with all the list-based strategies we've seen, so first fit and best fit and so on. And the other thing we've just seen with our body allocator is so-called internal fragmentation. This uh, body allocator, as we've seen, always allocates memory in powers of two, even if we don't use the whole power of two. So for example, for a request of 70, we've seen we had 128 memory blocks allocated here. So this means we don't have unused memory outside of the allocated memory area, but we have a certain amount of unused memory inside of this allocated memory area now. Uh, and this problem always happens if we round up request sizes, for example, to the next power of two. So we have to live with one kind or the other because just allocating each single byte in memory is far too much administrative overhead for our operating system. It takes too much time and it would also take uh, yeah, uh, too much memory essentially to store all this administrative information for each byte or word in memory. So where are these different uh, memory placement strategies actually used? Now, uh, this depends on your application. So essentially, if you're trying to allocate memory in the operating system or the system kernel itself, you usually use uh, something like a body allocator uh, to manage system memory and also to allocate memory to processes and to the operating system itself. Inside of processes, so in user mode, uh, you typically use linked list, for example, to manage heap memory and uh, to also enable this dynamic allocation of memory areas on the heap by the process. So this is using functions called malloc for memory allocation and free in the C library. And finally, you can use uh, memory placement strategies and allocation strategies for secondary storage. For example, if you want to manage the swap space, so the section of your hard disk or partition of your hard disk that is used to store memory segments that we swapped out from main memory in order to make space in main memory. And secondary storage allocation very often actually uses bitmaps to perform its tasks.